Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. A Detroit firefighter smashes into a car while driving drunk on the job. Now the defenders are hearing from a source who says that's just part of a larger problem with alcohol. But we start with breaking news. The gymnastics coach with ties to Larry Nasser is found dead at a rest stop on the day he faced his own set of lengthy criminal charges. Glad you're with us at six. Off the top, it has been a day full of disturbing developments involving John Geddert, a man who coached some of America's top athletes. Here's an overview of the situation. Geddert was a USA gymnastics coach and former associate of Larry Nasser. State Attorney General Dana Nessel announced several charges against Getter today. They include several counts of human trafficking and sex crimes. After Getter failed to appear for a video arraignment, he was found dead at a rest stop in Grand Ledge. And that's where Mara McDonald is standing by with the latest. Mara. Devin, take a look behind me. The rest stop in question is right there. It's right off of 96. The Michigan State Police have the entire area blocked off, which is why we are in a field across the freeway. And you're right, police source is confirming for us that John Geddert's body was found inside the rest stop here around 3.15 this afternoon. He has killed himself, we are told, single gunshot wound. Uh, Geddert was um, not just a local coach. He was a prominent figure in USA Gymnastics. He coached the 2012 women's Olympic team in London. He owned Twist Stars Gym in Diamonddale, which is where elite gymnasts would come to train. And it's also where Larry Nasser worked out of. Now, Geddert and Nasser weren't just associates. They were friends, and it became clear during Nasser's trials that a variety of gymnasts held John Geddert responsible for Larry Nasser's abuse of them because they say he enabled him. This afternoon, he was expected to be arraigned on charges stemming uh, not only from allegedly enabling Nasser, but his own behavior. He was supposed to be arraigned, I believe. They thought about two o'clock this afternoon. He didn't show up. That's when the call went out and he was discovered here uh, at this rest stop. So we are waiting for some sort of official word from the Michigan State Police. But right now they have the entire area blocked off. We're live in Watertown Township. I'm Mara McDonald, Local 4. Of course, just before his death, facing two dozen charges that had been announced, but not very many of them actually connected to Larry Nasser. Yeah, Grant Herms has a breakdown of those charges, and Grant, a lot of them were unusual. And those would be the human trafficking charges, of which there are 20. Now, they're being used not necessarily in the way that we think of human trafficking, but they do still fit under the state's newly expanded definition. In all, Getter was facing 24 charges, 20 counts of human trafficking, including four involving a minor. Attorney General Dana Nessel explaining the reasoning behind it. It is alleged that John Getter used force, fraud, and coercion against the young athletes that came to him for gymnastics training for a financial benefit to him. In an interview, survivor of Larry Nasser, an athlete under Geddert, Lindsay Lemke, describing the alleged abuse. When we were traveling to these competitions and we would win, we would win money, or rather so John would win money. And basically he's winning money off of our downfalls, off of our injuries, our, you know, everything that we were going through as his athletes. Getter was also charged with two counts of criminal sexual conduct, both involving minors between the ages of 13 and 16, allegedly happening in January of 2012. And then there were two more charges, one count of racketeering and another for lying to or misleading a police officer during the investigation into disgraced Dr. Larry Nasser. In all, Getter was facing upwards of 350 years behind bars. Now, several Larry Nasser survivors said today that these charges were a sense of hope, a sense of progress, and now it seems like any of that hope or progress they'll likely not be getting. We do want to say that there is a Michigan sexual assault survivors hotline 24 7 survivors can call. We'll have a link to that on clickondetroit.com. Back to you. Okay, Grant, thank you. Think of the Detroit Fire Department acknowledging one of their firefighters hit a car while driving drunk on the job. There are indications it may not have been an isolated incident. A whistleblower tells the local four defenders he's seen what goes on in the firehouses and he believes DFD has a full-blown drinking problem. Defender Sean Lay live with an update on the story that he broke here yesterday. Sean. 
And Devin, let's start with some context here, some perspective. Detroit EMS, 55,000 runs last year. DFD went on 22,000 runs. Tough, stressful job. One man tonight, though, is saying Detroit fire. Administration must confront what he is calling an on-duty drinking problem department-wide. Sunday night, Detroit Fire Department's Squad 6 smashes into a parked car arriving at an emergency. The department tells us their 26-year-old firefighter was drunk behind the wheel of a half-million-dollar fire engine. A firefighter driving drunk is shocking, but not to this man. Luckily, there was nobody in that car that day. Luckily, there wasn't a child crossing the street that day. He wants to protect his identity. He's worried about retaliation. He is not a firefighter, but has been in fire stations citywide. The firefighters union says a firefighter on duty driving drunk is an isolated incident. Is this an isolated incident? No, it's not. Why? Uh, uh, there's other stations that basically have alcohol flowing freely. Rumors about Detroit Fire Company Engine 50 on the east side being an out of control party house have swirled around the city for a long time. But the defenders are told it's not just Engine 50. You go into the mess room or they would eat at and the table is littered with beer cans and uh, different beers, different liquors. These guys were off duty? No, no they were on duty. What did you think when you saw all that? I'm sitting there going, oh my God, are you kidding me? You're going to get behind the wheel of a great big truck and try to put out a fire? Who's going to die? Sunday night, a party at Engine 50. A 37-year veteran senior chief, we are told, was there. The party was not shut down. The same chief then took the driver of the truck who hit the car for the alcohol screen and called a deputy chief, we're told, to tell him they have a firefighter driving drunk. Sources tell us at that moment, a dangerous mistake was made by those fire officials. Was the rest of his crew taken out of service at that moment then? No. No, the, the driver was taken by the chief for uh, the drug and alcohol screening and the other firefighters proceeded uh, with their duties. Meaning the department potentially left other impaired firefighters on duty that night. They're above the law. They're, they're not going to go ahead and they're not going to face the consequences like you or I would. Why do they think that? They have a badge. And are they ever held accountable? Not to my knowledge. That could be part of the problem? That could be a big, the biggest part of the problem. Back here live, attorney Steve Haney, who has some dealings with Detroit Fire, says if this was me or you behind the wheel of the car, you would have been arrested on the spot. This firefighter was not arrested, and he has not yet been charged. Keep in mind, this happened on Sunday. Detroit Fire says they handed the case over to Detroit Police. I checked with Detroit Police Internal Affairs. They do have the case, but will not say when they got the case. Did they get the case that night or after we started asking questions? Fire Commissioner Jones says... Full investigation going on. Anyone responsible will be held accountable. We're live tonight. Sean Lee, Local 4 Defenders. Okay, quite a story. All right, Sean. Today's coronavirus developments now. The state announces a vaccination milestone. Michigan has now given out more than 2 million vaccine doses. Today, state lawmakers passed a $2 billion COVID relief bill along party lines. However, the bill would stop the state from sending additional vaccine doses to more vulnerable communities, as Republican lawmakers say race and socioeconomic status should not be factors. Today, Michigan reports 1,388 new cases and 48 deaths. As many are desperately searching for the chance to get vaccinated, a substantial number of African Americans remain reluctant to roll up their sleeves. Some of those feelings are rooted in a horrific medical experiment that sowed deep seeds of mistrust. Tonight, the granddaughter of one of those abused so many years ago is speaking out to help others overcome their doubt. It's always been a part of the family history. We didn't talk about it much. Nutritionist Sharon Hawks says it's been hard to hear people citing the Tuskegee experiment as one reason they're reluctant to get a COVID vaccine. It have brought up bad emotions. Hawks' grandfather, Willie Harris, was a part of that experiment until his death in 1960. From 1932 until 1972, the Federal Public Health Service used 623 impoverished sharecroppers in rural Alabama to study the natural course of syphilis. The men were promised treatment but were only given placebos. That deceit leading to a mistrust of medicine, which for some continues to this day. 
the fact that they experimented on him for so many years without him even knowing what they were doing. But Hawks doesn't want that painful past to impact her community's future. She's helping run a COVID vaccination clinic at her Maryland church. I felt it was, it was a moral obligation to let people know and to get them comfortable with it. With people lined up and eager to be vaccinated, she hopes resistance is fading. This is not an experiment of someone trying to kill us off. Everyone is going after the same vaccine. She says her grandfather was denied treatment, which could have extended his life. She hopes people don't deny themselves a vaccine, which could save theirs. Here in Michigan, white residents are twice as likely to have received a COVID vaccine as blacks, although the state admits information about race is missing for more than 40% of our state's vaccine recipients. All right, ahead, we're going to hear from the man who broke uh, the MSP's color barrier, what he thinks of policing today compared to when he started. And here's Ben. Kevin Devin, there are only three more days left in February, and if I would have asked you last week, you probably would have said, let's move on. But if this is what we've got, maybe we should keep it around for a while. We'll look at the warmer temperatures for the weekend coming up. All right, Ben, also a hearing about Michigan nursing homes during the pandemic takes an emotional turn. That's next.